west from the Great Lakes. The wind sings like a wild bird across the northern states. Coming at last to this place, this sweep of America. 10,000 square miles of prairie across Montana and Dakota. They call it the Williston Basin. Not so long ago, this was frontier. Listen closely, and you will hear the old ghost echo of covered wagons. The phantom shadows of pioneers fighting for their lives against the wilderness. Lean men, hard as hickory. Lonely women wearing their dreams like a bit of bright calico. They began with nothing, with their bare hands and a bucket of hope. Breaking the land with freedom's plow. Planting towns with names American as a banjo tune. Fargo, Stampede, Bluegrass, Beaver Lodge, Lincoln Valley, Williston. Halverson's my name, Nils Halverson, wheat farmer and school teacher. I was born and raised here, east of Montana along the Canadian line. Williams County, North Dakota. If I were somewhere away at the end of the earth and thinking of home, the thing I'd remember would be winter. The enormous frozen silence. The snow cutting us off from the world like a wall. The wind slicing across the fields. The way we say it, gets the cold shadows freeze to the ground and have to be pried loose with a pickaxe. might seem like a sort of desolate place to some, but we're mostly Norwegian up this way. We've got an old immigrant prayer that goes, should all things perish fleeting as a shooting star, oh God, let not the ties break that bind me to the north. put in an hour of chores at the farm by the time I turn up at the school, a one-room country schoolhouse at the edge of a wheat field. I look at these kids with their restless faces, grandchildren of the pioneers, descendants of the long rifle and the bull tongue plow. I find myself wondering, that proud, searching spirit that drove men out along new trails, is it still alive in them, in me? I wonder if this familiar stretch of land were suddenly to become frontier again, how would we meet the test? It may not be long before we know. There's a tense feeling in the air, a sense of waiting, as though some great door is about to swing open. I remember how it all began, so quietly. A few solitary men climbing the hills, crossing the fields, a geologist searching for clues in the shape of a valley, the composition of a stone, the fossil of a leaf that was green at the time of the dinosaurs. And then the seismograph crew coming in to map the underground, drill a hole and drop a dynamite charge. 
the shock waves going down to hit the buried layers of stone and bounce back to be recorded on sensitive instruments. By then, we all knew what they were doing. The object of their search was oil. Hard to imagine that somewhere a thousand miles across the continent, men were adding years of scientific research, checking reports, approaching a decision that might open a new world on our doorstep. From all of our uh, available data, I say that this is it. East of Williston here, south of Tioga, in the southwest of 6, 155.95, there's a fair chance of striking oil in a number of reservoir rocks. I remember the day last winter, Saturday morning it was. I was working with my pa. He's a tough, stubborn old gent. Been out here in Dakota raising wheat since the days when there was nothing but log cabins and a railroad depot. A friend of ours came by, a local lawyer, Oscar Norstead. He had a fellow with him, a stranger named of Roland. Turned out to be a man from the Citadel Oil Company. I remember we invited them inside for some of my wife Barbara's good coffee and the usual talk about the weather and the wheat crop. The reason I'm here is we'd like to lease the mineral rights on your land. We're offering 10 cents an acre rentals on a 10-year lease. Wheat is good enough for me. Most of our uh, operation is underground. The fields are still yours. You can go right on farming. And if you should hit oil? Uh, you get the standard royalty, one-eighth of every barrel. Your company is crazy. There's no oil around here. Every four or five years, another company comes around, buys up a bunch of leases. There must be half a dozen dry holes out there on the prairie. We're willing to take our chances. How about it? We'll think it over. Do that. We want you to feel right about it. I'll be back in a week or so. I drink every drop of oil you can find in North Dakota. No sooner did the first visitor take off than the next one came rolling in. Another landman from Burns Petroleum. I remember within a week we had half a dozen offers. We took our time deciding. We've worked hard for what we've got. It took the sweat of generations to turn the prairie into wheat land. And then came the 30s. I was only a kid, but I'll never forget the dead look of the land burnt dry by the drought. When the wheat went, everything went. The debts piled up until there was nothing a man could do but slam the door and walk away. Somehow my pa hung on. He had a motto. Stick and stay, it's bound to pay. And it did, finally. A few seasons of rain and the earth was rich again. The fields golden with grain. The wheat like a running river. So now when the oil companies came, we took our time making up our minds. A man with a couple of full silos and 50 head of cattle can afford to take his time. Finally, we signed with Citadel. That was last year, and since then, not a word out of them. Maybe they've found out there isn't any oil. Maybe Pa was right. Neil, over at Bronson's place, they started drilling. Is that right? They're crazy as a bunch of hoodows. Come on, I want to go see. Well, all right, let's go take a look.
Out in Bronson's North 40, they were putting up a giant 10-story derrick they call a rig. The geologists showed us around, and it was like watching a little town take shape. Welders and roustabouts working in the stinging cold, putting up the drilling platform, digging the mud pit, stacking pipe, stringing power lines, working with numbed feet and icy fingers, getting things ready to sink the drilling bit into the frozen earth. We can get out of the wind in here. Guess once you start to drill, you're pretty sure of finding oil down there. We're not sure of anything. In this business, it's always maybe. The only way to find out is to drill. Only about one out of nine of those wildcats ever comes in. How much does it cost to drill a well like that? Well, it depends. The first hole, drilling in this weather, as deep as we'll have to go, probably cost about half a million. That's the oil business, a real gamble. One out of nine with half a million riding on the black. Pretty tough odds. Plenty of men willing to take it, especially when there's a chance to make a profit. Indian Arrowhead? Yeah, found it right over there, right where we put the rig. It's for luck, we're gonna need it. In the evenings after that, I watched Barbara. I could see she had visions of an oil well out in the middle of our wheat field. New wallpaper in the parlor and a college fund for the kids we hope to have someday. And Pa, he keeps saying they're crazy, but he's dreaming too. 10 more head of cattle, a new barn, a new harrow, the old one's about shot. And me? I don't know. I'm not sure. What sort of changes will it bring? Everywhere in town, you hear people talk about oil. The farmers around the county, the closest most of them have ever been to oil, is putting a couple of quarts into a tractor. And suddenly, they become experts talking about jackknife rigs and rotary drills. Of course, there are plenty who still say, I'll stick with wheat. I told my pa, if we get oil, let's get a car as long as a house. What did he say? We'll be lucky if we get a wheelbarrow. <laughs> Afternoons when I get home from school, before I start my chores, I find myself going out to the rig to stand with Joe Guthrie, the tool pusher, watching the crew. A rugged bunch of boys, tong buckers from Texas, roughnecks from Oklahoma and Arkansas. Watch them changing a bit, pull out the pipe, clamp on the big tongs. The man on the cat head spins her in reverse, uncoupling the 90-foot joint of drill pipe. And then the block hoists it to the derrick man up on his monkey board, 85 feet overhead, waiting to snare the pipe and manhandle it over into the rack. Then the block shooting down again to grab the next joint. Split second timing. Slam on the brakes. Clamp on the tongs. Yank out the safety slips, the driller and the tongue buckers working together with the swift precision of an all-American backfield. A rugged, proud, independent breed, always ready to pull up stakes and head out to wherever there's oil to be found. California, Montana, Gulf of Mexico, or right in our own backyard.
nights back in town, a group of us began getting together. Store owners, doctors, lawyers. All right, maybe it will all come to nothing. Maybe it's just another false alarm. All I'm saying is, it's important that we plan a little, just in case. Plan for what? Housing, office space. We're liable to have 50 companies, a couple thousand newcomers overnight. What about health facilities? We're overcrowded at the hospitals as it is. I can tell you that if they strike oil, it'll be the biggest thing that ever hit this state. It'll be the frontier all over again. New folks rolling in. And their children. Who knows how many? Do we have room for them in our schools? What is this oil? What happens when they find it? A wild scramble, boom, and bust? What happens? I don't know. I, I'm just asking. I want to know. Well, Mr. Mayor, I moved. We set up a... We ended up by forming a Citizens Petroleum Committee to work with the oil companies and get the facts, to make a survey of the town and find out exactly what facilities we had. Meanwhile, Citadel was learning the hard way about a North Dakota winter. The deadly cold, 30 below, and the wind like a fist in your face. Most of the crew was from the south, and to them, the cold was beyond belief. The supply trucks were having trouble getting through fighting a nerve-wracking battle to keep moving along the highways. It got so when a man left home for the rig, they'd radio on ahead to make sure he wasn't marooned somewhere. A dozen times cars were stranded, and they had to send out searching parties. The company was taking every precaution it could. But it was a brutal, back-breaking job, struggling against the ice 24 hours around the clock. Sometimes the bitter weather got to be more than a man was willing to take. Where are you going? To get my fur hat! Where's it at? In Oklahoma! Yet somehow the drilling went on and the bit kept gnawing away at the iron hard earth. Funny to think of those Indians living here for centuries, those first homesteaders. With maybe a fortune right under their feet? How could they have known? And if they'd known, what could they have done about it? You're right. It takes the tools, the skill, the freedom to explore, invent, discover. You think of the gold rush. All those people racing for the hills. Some of them passing right over a treasure a thousand times more rich, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> it seems as though everywhere you go, people are passing along reports on the latest depth. I hear she's down to 5,000 feet. They tell me she hit 6,200 this morning. Down to 8,255. And then the day came when they got down past 11,000 and the drilling stopped. The end of the line. The word spread that if there was any oil, this would be the last depth where they could hit it. For miles around, people came to watch. Just a thin pipe sticking out of the ground over an empty pit. And everyone waiting. This is the payoff. Or is it? A few moments and they'll be throwing open the valve. We stand there, our eyes glued to that pipe. Will it just keep spilling its thin stream of muddy water, or will it gush forth the white foam that means oil? Waiting, waiting. 
each of us with his hopes, his secret dreams. This is not all to drink. <laughs> they flash the word from the field to the production office at Williston, and from there to the central office in Oklahoma. Day and night, our little telephone board was lit up like a Christmas tree. Calls from New York, California, Houston. Bit by bit, we began to realize how big a thing this was. A river of cars came pouring in from every corner of the country. The streets and hotels jammed with a stream of newcomers, reflecting all the marvelous, varied cross-weave of America. Every day bringing a new flood of cars. Every train bringing new faces a construction engineer coming in on a fast express from Cheyenne, a pipe salesman flying up from Tulsa, trucking outfits and supply companies bringing in everything from six-inch bolts to storage tanks, riveting guns to road graders, rig builders and drilling contractors rolling in ready for work, a hundred oil companies racing to get a foot in the doorway, competing for leases, drilling wells across 10,000 square miles of North Dakota and Montana. Landmen and lawyers waiting their turn to pour over the county records. All the planning by the Citizens Committee finally paid off. We were ready with lists of available office space. New housing was underway. There were extra books for the new kids at school. A thousand questions were in the air. The oil companies tried to answer them by picking a panel of experts and sending them out across the basin to a series of town meetings. Perhaps you're not familiar with the fact that petroleum is a source of insecticides, rust preventatives, plastics, alcohol, and a thousand other products. However, it is not possible to give you all of the uses of crude oil at this time. Perhaps some of you have some questions. Do any of you folks have any questions? I was just wondering, how long is all this going to last? I guess what's on your mind is the old story of boom and bust. I can assure you that we will be in the Williston Basin for a great many years looking for oil. The exploration process is only in its infancy. In the old days, the idea was to punch as many holes in the shortest time possible. Get the oil and get it quick. But like everybody else, the oil companies live and learn. Our policy is scientific conservation in the best interest of the people. All over the country, we're learning how to produce our fields in a manner in which we can ensure ourselves of the greatest ultimate recovery. If I still had any questions about boom and bust, through the next month, I saw the answer with my own eyes. I became aware of the new techniques the modern miracles of conservation the companies had devised. I began to realize that this was something that stretched far beyond these familiar fields. Here they were producing power for the nation, to run its cars and to heat its houses, to run its factories and to keep it strong. The ceaseless pounding of work was like a heartbeat, pouring energy out through the veins of America. And then the word came that on next Monday morning, they were going to start drilling on our land. Of course, we hoped our well would come in, but I couldn't help thinking. Suppose they hit a dry hole. It had happened before to our neighbors across the fields. And what about the folks back in town who don't own any land? 
What about them? What would oil mean to their future? Again, I found the answer before my eyes. I found it on the morning Tommy Larson forgot his lunch and his pa stopped by to drop it off. That was the first I knew Fred Larson had taken a job with an oil company. Then I began to realize that there were others, local people working at new jobs, experts coming in, bringing their special skills and teaching them in turn to my friends. I finally understood that oil will enrich the lives of hundreds of my neighbors who will never own a well or see a drop of petroleum. I finally knew for sure that the coming of oil was good for all of us. The wind of spring blows west from the Great Lakes. The warm wind sings across Montana and Dakota. Coming at last to this place. But there is a new song in the air, a song of great promise. Winter will come again, but it will never be the same. For this land is more than wheat now, and life is no longer at the mercy of the seasons. Now, in this place, a new frontier is born. A new breed of pioneers work to bring forth the riches of the land. The pounding temple rising from this prairie is the heartbeat of a great nation, forever seeking a new American frontier. one-room country schoolhouse at the edge of a wheat field. I look at these kids with their restless faces, grandchildren of the pioneers, descendants of the long rifle and the bull tongue plow. I find myself wondering, that proud searching spirit that drove men out along new trails, is it still alive in them, in me? I wonder if this familiar stretch of land were suddenly to become frontier again, how would we meet the test? It may not be long before we know. There's a tense feeling in the air, a sense of waiting, as though some great door is about to swing open. I remember how it all began, so quietly. A few solitary men climbing the hills, crossing the fields. A geologist searching for clues in the shape of a valley, the composition of a stone, the fossil of a leaf that was green at the time of the dinosaurs. And then the seismograph crew coming in to map the underground, drill a hole and drop a dynamite charge. The shock waves going down to hit the buried layers of stone and bounce back to be recorded on sensitive instruments. By then, we all knew what they were doing. The object of their search was oil. Hard to imagine that somewhere a thousand miles across the continent, men were adding years of scientific research, checking reports, approaching a decision that might open a new world on our doorstep. From all of our uh, available data, I'd say that this is...
forest from the Great Lakes. The wind sings like a wild bird across the northern states. Coming at last to this place, this sweep of America. 10,000 square miles of prairie across Montana and Dakota. They call it the Williston Basin. Not so long ago, this was frontier. Listen closely, and you will hear the old ghost echo of covered wagons. The phantom shadows of pioneers fighting for their lives against the wilderness. Lean men hard as hickory, lonely women wearing their dreams like a bit of bright calico. They began with nothing, with their bare hands and a bucket of hope, breaking the land with freedom's plow, planting towns with names American as a banjo tune, Fargo, Stampede, Bluegrass, Beaver Lodge, Lincoln Valley, Williston. In another landman from Burns Petroleum. I remember within a week we had half a dozen offers. We took our time deciding. We've worked hard for what we've got. It took the sweat of generations to turn the prairie into wheat land. And then came the 30s. I was only a kid, but I'll never forget the dead look of the land burnt dry by the drought. When the wheat went, everything went. The debts piled up until there was nothing a man could do but slam the door and walk away. Somehow my pa hung on. He had a motto, stick and stay, it's bound to pay. And it did, finally. A few seasons of rain and the earth was rich again. The fields golden with grain. The wheat like a running river. So now when the oil companies came, we took our time making up our minds. A man with a couple of full silos and 50 head of cattle can afford to take his time. Finally, we signed with Citadel. That was last year. And since then, not a word out of them. Maybe they've found out there isn't any oil. Maybe Pa was right. Neil, over at Bronson's place, they started drilling. Is that right? Uh, gracious, a bunch of hoodows. Come on, I want to go see. Well, all right, let's go take a look. Out in Bronson's North 40, they were putting up a giant 10-story derrick they call a rig. here south of Tioga in the southwest of 6 15595 there's a fair chance of striking oil in a number of reservoir rocks I remember the day last winter Saturday morning it was I was working with my pa he's a tough stubborn old gent been out here in Dakota raising wheat since the days when there was nothing but log cabins and a railroad depot A friend of ours came by, a local lawyer, Oscar Norstead. He had a fellow with him, a stranger named of Roland. Turned out to be a man from the Citadel Oil Company. I remember we invited them inside for some of my wife Barbara's good coffee and the usual talk about the weather and the wheat crop. The reason I'm here is we'd like to lease the mineral rights on your land. We're offering 10 cents an acre rentals on a 10-year lease. Wheat is good enough for me. Most of our uh, operation is underground. 
the fields are still yours. You can go right on farming. And if you should hit oil? Uh, you get the standard royalty, one-eighth of every barrel. Your company is crazy. There's no oil around here. Every four or five years, another company comes around, buys up a bunch of leases. There must be half a dozen dry holes out there on the prairie. We're willing to take our chances. How about it? We'll think it over. Do that. We want you to feel right about it. I'll be back in a week or so. I drink every drop of oil you can find in North Dakota. No sooner did the first visitor take off than the next one came rolling in. Halverson's my name, Nils Halverson, wheat farmer and school teacher. I was born and raised here, east of Montana along the Canadian line, Williams County, North Dakota. If I were somewhere away at the end of the earth and thinking of home, the thing I'd remember would be winter. The enormous frozen silence. The snow cutting us off from the world like a wall. The wind slicing across the fields. The way we say it, gets the cold, shadows freeze to the ground and have to be pried loose with a pickaxe. seem like a sort of desolate place to some, but we're mostly Norwegian up this way. We've got an old immigrant prayer that goes, should all things perish, fleeting as a shooting star, oh God, let not the ties break that bind me to the north. put in an hour of chores at the farm by the time I turn up at the school. 